From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noble. They call me Ben. We're joined, as always, with our super producer, Paul Mission Control Deccant. Most importantly, you are you, you are here, and that makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. Now, uh, folks, in the interest of full disclosure, we, uh, all, all three of us, uh, we, we three conspiracy realists right now, have a uh, soundtrack in our heads from a television show and and matt you were doing a lovely rendition of this right before we we went to air and i hereby refuse to do it on uh, air okay. because it's not <laughs> that's, okay that's pretty close Noel. sorry i'm done it's pretty close, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Well, the show you're talking about, In Search Of, the first time I ever heard it was in a Tenacious D song about Sasquatch, and they say, In Search Of Sasquatch, that was a kick-ass In Search Of, with <laughs> Leonard Nimoy <laughs> kicking out the jams. I didn't mm. know at the time that that was a show. I just thought it was just like, this is a really awesome in search of, like searching for, you know, <laughs> stream of consciousness. Yeah, yeah. And then what's Leonard Nimoy got to do with anything? Like you tenacious, you guys are weird. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in search of is a, a television program that ran. It's, it's kind of a, a similar genre to things that came later that, that you might recognize. Like what was the one? Oh, uh, the guy who plays Walter on fringe. Um, he did he did a series where he's investigating stuff. It's it's got like this unsolved mystery oh, yeah. meets history channel. The format has been uh, tried and true, you know, that now there's what's it called with uh with William Shatner. Yeah. <laughs> following Ooh. in Leonard's footsteps. That one's called uh, The Unexplained with an X. That's right. Explained. Right. And, and then Riker did one, uh who is a real person, has a real name that is not space affiliated. Anyway, uh we're we, like you, love mysteries, folks. Uh, and one of the most surprising things for any enthusiast of mysteries is how many remain unsolved. And they come up cyclically sometimes, right? There are some big mysteries that seem to hit the national consciousness at regular intervals, right? There will always be a think piece about JFK. Right or 9-11, or the Titanic, et cetera, et cetera, uh, Area 51, and so on. Today's episode is about a mystery that remains unsolved. In, in this case, it's unsolved. You may, it's, you may have heard of it, quite possibly, uh, but it's one that was sadly mischaracterized pretty often in its time. And now, as we record today, it's become the subject of numerous documentaries. It's inspired works of art. There's an off-Broadway play that was made about this. There's rock songs, you know, Leonard Nimoy put it on in search of. So that's kind of a gold standard. Uh, it's 2023 <laughs> as we're recording, and the world is still asking, what happened to Michael Rockefeller? Yeah, one of those Rockefellers. The Rockefeller Rockefellers. Uh -huh. Here <laughs> yeah. are the facts. Yeah, not those off-brand Rockefellers. Uh, no. Not we have Rockefellers at home, Rockefellers. The ones the center is named after. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And there are no records here. Riri is not a part of this episode. <laughs> <laughs> Worth it. Uh, and there, there's also, you know, you have, this is one of those things where if you are, are living in the United States or if you spent any time in that country, you have encountered the work of the Rockefellers in, in some degree and likely across generations. Despite um, how it may be portrayed on paper, the U.S. does very much have an aristocracy. And the Rockefellers, I would argue, are members of that aristocracy, which doesn't necessarily make them bad, but it's like you need to know. Now, um, our subject for today, Michael, let's learn a little bit about him. Michael Clark Rockefeller. Yeah, he was born May 18th, 1938. His father was Nelson Rockefeller. This uh, this man is very interesting. And honestly, got to say, everybody came into this episode a little biased. I would say anti-Rockefeller <laughs> a little bit just because, you know, 
it's easy target for like, uh, there's probably something bad going on there because there's a the lot fat cats, of money. You know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I learned a lot about his father, Nelson Rockefeller, and I would recommend you, everyone out there, just take a look at Nelson Rockefeller. The uh, He's described as a progressive liberal Republican. Really interesting stuff. Uh, we, we maybe Back could when learn. that was a thing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe we could all learn a little something about that. Uh, he also served as VP under Gerald Ford as vice president. Uh, and, hey, guess who the secretary of state was during that time, guys? Leonard Nimoy. Henry Kissinger. It was Henry Kissinger. <laughs> okay, that would have been my second guess. Yeah, I, I would have I would have preferred a, a Nimoy-led uh, State Department, but I wasn't on good enough terms for us to talk that out. You know, got it. Spock is just so calm and collected and diplomatic. I mean, he seems like he'd be great in government. I don't know whether the State Department of that time would have vibed with Vulcan philosophy. You know, that whole needs of the many kind of stuff. Well, that sounds a lot like communism. Uh, <laughs> right. I feel like data would have been a better choice or that's probably what's going to happen in the next couple of, you know, yeah, presidencies. Yeah. <laughs> And just as we do every time that he comes up, let's give a real quick check. We might have to build a sound cue for this at some point. Let's give a real quick check and confirm, drum roll, please. Heinz Alfred Kissinger is still alive. And his next birthday is May 27th. All right. Which is his what birthday? It's going to be a big one, man. Uh, he is going to be 100 years old. Wow. What is that called? A septuagenarian? Uh, a centenarian. Centenarian, excuse centenarian. me. Centenarian. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good at math. I, I mean, those are fun words to whip out, right? Can you imagine? I, the thing about being a centenarian is by the time you get there, do you really brag about it? Or do you just want, you know, like juice and a nap? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I, I'm 39 and I want juice and a nap right now. <laughs> I mean, who could say no to juice and a nap or at least juice? I have juice, though. Nice. Uh, and, and you've got a Garfield mug that says I'm kind of a big deal. <laughs> yeah. So okay. my kid got it for me. <laughs> nice. Uh, and we're talking about families, right? You can't really talk about Michael Rockefeller without talking about the Rockefellers. And Nelson Rockefeller, as you said, Matt, is a fascinating character. And some would argue fairly anomalous, especially if you look at um, history through a narrative of social and financial class, right? A socioeconomic lens would tell you that a Nelson Rockefeller doesn't happen super often. Uh, but by the time Michael is born, you know, he's like the baby of the family. This is a genuine American dynasty. His father, uh, Nelson Rockefeller, had already done some big things. He was established. And uh, Nelson came from John D. Rockefeller Jr. J.D. B yep, J.D., big, big deal financier, right? Financier, we say, so it sounds classier. Okay, so just to get the lineage correctly, like Game of Thrones style, in terms of the, the first or second or third of his name, they all had different first names, but he was the grandson of John D. Rockefeller, of the Rockefeller Rockefellers, Jr., uh, and the great-grandson of the John D. Rockefeller. So that's that would be first of his name, Jr. would be second of his name. Uh, and John D. Sr. was the founder of Standard Oil, which you may have heard of. That's It's not called that anymore, but is it, what, what did it become? It's definitely some iteration of it still very much around. And this is also an example of kind of being first to market uh, on the ground floor, if you will, for something like oil. <laughs> you know, hey, Back when you could just name it standard, mm -hmm. you know, you know, like the it, one. Mm -hmm. it reminds me of that. We don't have to impress you so much, right? There's oil. That's what you need to know, folks. Uh, it's kind of, it still reminds me of um, n weird naming conventions, like how there was this restaurant in Atlanta called legal seafood. Right. Yeah, that's a, I think that's actually a chain. Um, it's so in, many like, questions Boston or something. But uh, if, if you've seen the film, there will be blood. Standard mm -hmm. Oil is, is 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 mentioned a lot. It's sort of the main competition to Daniel Day Lewis's character, Daniel Plainview. Well, yeah, it was around for uh, several years in the eighteen like eighteen seventy, I think, is when it started. But then, guess what? The government came through and said. Uh, this is a monopoly and it got broken mm -hmm. up into a bunch of different companies. I think so 40 something companies. 
Oh, and geez. Then, yeah, <laughs> it did. Must have been quite a monopoly. The people, the tycoons and titans of industry who owned companies that got broken up for their monopolies said, hey, you know what we should do? We should get into government. And then a few generations later, their families totally did. So the... <laughs> So that's a story for a different time, maybe. But um, but yeah, like we said, Michael is the youngest kid. He has a twin sister. There are a lot of other kids who come before him. But being a Rockefeller and a smart dude, he still gets a top-notch silver spoon type education. The Buckley School, Phillips Exeter, goes to Harvard, where he graduated cum laude. Uh, but one of the... There's an author we're going to talk about a lot, a guy named Carl Hoffman. And Hoffman writes beautifully about Rockefeller, about this story in particular. And Hoffman seems to argue that Rockefeller has another education, another moment that really speaks to him and shapes his destiny. And that's when he goes to his family's museum. Because, you know, his family has a museum. How cool would that be? <laughs> I want to go to you, your family's museums. And, and, and my first thought was like, is this a museum of the history of the Rockefellers? Because even at this point, it's kind of a thing. I mean, maybe. They're, yeah, they're maybe. an important part of, uh, of culture. But no, it was, in fact, uh, Rockefellers were fans of modern art uh, and also um, a bit of a loaded term, primitive art that is not. Guys, isn't this MoMA? Yeah, like the museum now it's of MoMA, modern art. but they don't call it the Museum of Primitive Art <laughs> no, no, no. anymore at the the MoMA. Yeah, right, right. The, the The Museum of Primitive Art inside the MoMA eventually gets closed out, but at the time it's opening, our buddy Michael, he's eighteen years old. He's uh, he's hanging with the swells. It's a black tie private reception event before the Museum of Primitive Art opens. And his father gives this speech. Nelson Rockefeller gives this speech about how important it is to understand art. Now, this speech, just to be clear, doesn't age super well, as you could tell by the word primitive thrown around kind of loosey-goosey. But this rocks Michael's world. Feller. Sorry. <laughs> Rockefeller's his world. Mm-hmm. Yes. Rocks yes. his old fella. Yeah. It rocks his fellas left and right. Uh, and his his perspective is skewed in a in a very important, very profound way for him because he's seen this entire world, right? He's seen physical, tangible artifacts of this entire world that he's only heard about, he's only read about, and he's thinking there's something outside of this cage of privilege, right? Because fame, wealth, the things people think they want, they can often be a cage, you know? And and we get the feeling, at least the way Hoffman tells it, that Michael Rockefeller at this young age is going through something like that. Yeah, and he acts on those feelings, uh, joins the army, uh, spends some time as a private. Um, and in the early 60s, he goes on an expedition of, of self-discovery and also, you know, d- external discovery uh, to study the Dani tribe of New Guinea for Harvard's Peabody Museum. Hmm? OK, folks from that part of the, the world, I, I said it right, uh, of archaeology and ethnology. Yeah. And, uh, you know. This is a guy who he's got all the stuff, right? If he needs some stuff, he can get it, right? Mm -hmm. doesn't matter what the stuff is. He can get it if he wants it. (laughs) He like snaps his fingers and someone shows up with a Diet Coke and a Lego set, you know, if that's what he wants. Oh, (laughs) jeez. Yeah. Unlimited Legos, I guess. But, but, but here's the thing. He doesn't go, he doesn't travel to this part of the world as that person, Right. He doesn't have his huge entourage. He's not there. You know, no one's w- watching over him hand and foot in that way. He's actually, it, it, I don't know, Ben, it, I don't want to put anything on you, but it reminds me of the way you'll travel. Like, just immerse yourself into a place and kind of uh, become one. Does that make sense? I like to think that, especially, oh, man, we're so excited to get back on the road as a group. But I, I think especially when we're traveling as a crew, as a unit, we do the same thing. You know, we we often, <laughs> we were just talking about this. Uh, we were in Texas a while back, and the three of us were just on a night walk. And there was a moment where we got we got clocked, right? 
Somebody made us. Mm-hmm. We got recognized. <laughs> we got made. Uh, <laughs> that was fun. Yeah, no, I think we all are fans of like full immersion travel. I mean, it really is the only way to fly. Um, it's just uh, kind of having not really a schedule, but like, you know, just really feeling like you just kind of discover things as they present themselves to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and we've run into some really cool and some very strange situations. As a result, what I love about your point, Matt, is that, yeah, this guy could have traveled with an entourage, you know, and, and said, uh, bring me the people, you know, I want Diet Cokes and Lego sets and artifacts. And I will bring them to my father, but he didn't. Well, yeah, and I and I need two bodyguards at all times while I'm traveling mm-hmm. in this other right. country, Ooh, right? I mean, yeah. which would be yeah, yeah. almost standard if you're uh, in that level, right, of having money. Uh, but he didn't do like that. like the oil. Yeah, mm. it's true. Um, tiny little aside. It reminds me. It's it's, it's a little bit of a sad uh, analogy, but I just saw this thing where at one point Michael Jackson. Um, paid or like his people like basically rented out a grocery store for a day uh, and then like members of his entourage posted as regular shoppers so that Michael Jackson could feel what it felt like to grocery shop yeah apparently that's a true story too. no there's video of it <laughs> oh, <laughs> he's like he's, he's, he's gliding around on the, on the cart like Superman <laughs> it's like because that's what you do when you grocery shop <laughs> I mean, if you're not, if you're taking a cart through a parking lot and you don't ride it a little bit, you're dead are you really living. <laughs> yeah. Are you just surviving or are you living, dude? Uh, and I, I've gotten some looks before. Actually, I recently raced a total stranger on a cart in a parking lot. It was a very amicable race. Did you say wee? I didn't. I okay, didn't. That's okay. I should have. Next, next time. It, it adds no, to the we just both did the bro nod. When we got, it was almost not a race. I guess we were just riding together in a Publix. But, Did you do uh, the Mario Kart like, thing? Beep, beep, <laughs> beep. Did you pelt him with red shells? <laughs> you got to get that boost on the beep, beep. You got to hit that, hit that accelerate right then. Then you get a little boost. <laughs> Pro I think tip, it, y'all. <laughs> that's great. I think, uh, I think we did, uh, we had that moment where, you know, we're looking at each other and we're realizing, oh, this is the highlight of both our Saturday nights and we're both probably too old to be doing this. No such you, thing. You can translate a lot through a bro nod, you know? Anyway, if you're hearing this, I, w- I wish you luck, my friend. May the carts be ever in your favor. And I love you. No. All right. Sorry. Well, that, was my, that was my editorializing. And, I'm, and, I'm, I'm doing fanfic for you guys now at this point. And, <laughs> and no loves you. So, uh, so, uh, Yeah. Okay. This is the thing. He doesn't do any of that stuff we're describing. He is the sound guy for this documentary. And no, no shade on sound guys, but it is sort of considered a a bit of a grunt job. Uh, You know, you have to keep your levels right and and get good sound, but you're basically holding up a boom mic the whole time and toting around. Like at this point, it would have been like a Nagra uh, tape, you know, recorder, like a portable uh, reel to reel, mini reel to reel. So those things are heavy. So he he kind of relegated himself when he could have insisted on being the director. You know, he had the clout to make that happen. You know, you want some financing? I'm the director, or at the very least, been pushy. But he wasn't. I really, it speaks volumes to the guy's whole attitude, I think. It's cool. And it's hard. It's a hard job. That's right. Especially traipsing around the wilderness, you know? Well, and he also, it's, he didn't just have audio equipment, which you're, as you're saying is correct, there, it's very heavy stuff. He's also got, a big camera, a big heavy camera back in the day, and all the equipment you need to make that camera run, and all you know, all the film you have to carry, and all that stuff, dude. Yeah, like yeah. a still camera, yeah, yeah, right? yeah. But still, <laughs> but still, yeah, but still, yeah, it's still a lot. And the lenses are big and, and heavy and bulky. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and you know, he's moving in a group. This is a this is a proper expedition, as they would call it in that time. Uh, but I think we all have immense respect for him. The the four of us on the show today, including including Paul, um, we have been in those situations, we, even with uh, much more sophisticated, newer equipment, where we're going around and we're just hoping whatever we had to improvise two minutes ago works, you know, racing batteries, all that crap. Even nowadays with, um, you know, cameras and stuff, you still have to 
it's it's a process to get usable content. You know, whether you're recording audio with another phone, you know, and then you sync it up later and just being aware in that way and observing through that lens, it really is, you know, a mental uh, uh, strain as well, you know? So just like, imagine this is all going on, right? Michael's out there in the wilderness. They're shooting a documentary that I, I believe you can, there, isn't there footage of this that you can actually find right now, Ben? Uh, yeah, it's a, you can see and hear his expeditions work in a documentary called Dead Birds. Mm. Sounds like a bummer. Yeah, uh, full disclosure, I haven't watched the entirety of this, uh, but you can you can easily find clips. Uh, I don't want to say anything other than go through the official channels. Okay. Noted. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. So <laughs> during during this time, he is finding other things. He's always like in letters to his family, we know that he is having one of the most exciting periods of his life. And he's wondering what's next, what's over the horizon. Because this is a place where a lot of uh, what he thinks of as civilization or Western civilization has not traveled. So he briefly leaves this expedition to study a different group that we should probably talk about a little bit, the Asmat tribe or Asmat tribe, uh, A-S-M-A-T. They're on the southwestern coast of Dutch colonial Guinea uh, and, or New Guinea. And he, he, he feels like he is connected. He's back in that moment at the museum where he heard his dad's awesome speech. Cause you know, if you're that level of politician, you're probably good at speeches. And, and so he's recalling this and we actually, we have his correspondence or part of it from this time. Yeah, he says, uh, I am having a thoroughly exhausting but most exciting time here. The Asmat is like a huge puzzle with the variations in ceremony and art style forming the pieces. Uh, my trips are enabling me to comprehend, if only in a superficial, rudimentary manner, the nature of this puzzle. And that was from a letter uh, from Michael uh, on November 13th, 1961. Um, so he's talking about pieces and art style. That was sort of a hallmark of this uh, this group. Correct. Yeah, the Asmat people in particular, he found their art fascinating. They would have these incredibly sophisticated and do have these incredibly sophisticated wood carvings that were made to honor ancestors. And you can you can see pictures of this very easily. Actually, some of it is in the MoMA today, I believe. Uh, and this just rocks his world. And he wants to be the person. He wants to be Promethean. He wants to bring this back to New York. Because you got to remember this time, this was this was like a, a discovery. Not essentially. I mean, the, this style of art, this kind of work wasn't something that folks in Western art circles would have been aware of at all. This is like something new. Yeah. Not many people would have been aware of it in in kind of the the upper echelons of the art circles at the time. And so the, their lifestyle also seems very, I don't want to say alien or foreign, but it's very different to what he's experienced up to this point. And this also enthralls him. And so he goes this one time and then he says, I want to travel back a second time. And when I travel back, I'm going to barter and I'm going to collect enough material to make this world-class exhibit when I come back, you know, to the uh, to the blue blood region uh, of my homeland. Do you think he was being um, equitable with these barters? Like, I mean, uh, you know, because you think about art and artifacts like this often being like stolen or at the very least kind of swindled, <laughs> you know, uh, out of folks that maybe, you know, were not uh, up, up on these kinds of tactics. But Michael strikes me as a little bit better uh, than that. Um, I'm just wondering what you think. I don't know. You know, we've never, we haven't met the guy. It's possible that we might. It's not probable, but it's possible. <laughs> we've, we've never met the guy. Um, and it is, I don't know. It becomes a matter of conjecture because even if you're going into a place like that, doing something like that with the best of intentions, you might be romanticizing people, right. right? Exoticizing them, you know, when the, when the reality is they're just people living their lives as best they can. I wonder if we can just quickly talk about the, the, the people, because it, 
within that in search of episode Leonard Nimoy, he, he pronounces it as Osmot. And I wrote down, I wrote down the name way incorrectly before I looked it up, like how to actually spell it. Cause it's spelled A S M A T, which roughly translates to tree people. If, if yes. you look up the, the ritualization of the simple task of cutting down a tree and then using that tree for, you know, the tribe, it is beautiful and fascinating and awesome. And I think that's exactly why Michael became so interested. It reminds me of the some restaurants and the, the philosophy behind making food uh, that's totally. really popular right now where you Slow use food. Well, you use every part of the animal, right? It's, mm. You translate that to using every part of the tree in this case. Uh, uh, but I know it's just re- it really interested me personally. And, and like, you know, maybe a, a modern equivalent might be something like chainsaw sculptures. But again, they didn't have chainsaws. They didn't have any kind of power tools. This was all done in the most, you know, uh, bespoke, handcrafted way possible. No no shade on chainsaw sculptures. Yeah, but but imagine using every piece of the bark. Every oh, piece that gets cut off at, it becomes a part of the village itself in everyday life. It's really bark cool. can be used in medicines as well and things. I mean, I'm sure they were, you know, the roots and certain aspects like that could be used to make tea or whatever. I mean, there's a, there's a bunch of things uh, you can use a tree for just like an animal. Yeah, and so did he find this beautiful? Yes, undoubtedly. To the earlier question, did he was he doing his best to be equitable in his bartering? To not take advantage of these right. people. Right. Probably he was. He was probably not trying to take advantage. He was probably trying to say, here are things that are of value to you and let's trade. I'm not going to take this from you. Uh, and I also want to tell your story. I want to share your voice with the world, you know? So he wasn't setting out thinking, oh, I'm going to get a, over on a bunch of rubes or anything like that. Not to romanticize, you know, uh, him, but I think that's pretty cool, <laughs> you know? I mean, comparatively, that's yeah, for he's, sure. in, he's like at this time, this is a Dutch colonial possession and colonialism has a bad name for a reason. So he also, of course, being a big deal, being one of the VIPs of the world at the time, whether or not he likes that, uh, he is a, assigned a government anthropologist named Rene Wassing. And Wassing is on these expeditions with him. Uh, Wassing is sort of like a fixer, sort of a minder, sort of a, uh, a sidekick, the guy who, who knows the lay of the land. Livingston to his, the other guy. <laughs> yes, yeah, Livingston to his other guy. And so Wassing and Rockefeller and these two local teenage guides, they set off, and in this next trip, operating out of kind of their home base, this next trip, they spend three weeks visiting 13 different villages in the region. They're collecting everything that they can barter for, and they're also... Try maybe just as, or more importantly, they're trying to make connections, which will be important to some theories later. And they get back to their home base, you know, offload what they got, get some more supplies, some more goods to barter for and, and provisions and so on. They set off again. And on November 17th, 1961, things go wrong. They are going to head down to Southern Osmat or Osmat or however you want to say it. And they're very excited about this because, again, in his mind, in Michael Rockefeller's mind, this is unknown country. And you can see in his letters, he talks about how frontiers in general are disappearing and he wants to see the wild. So the Osmat is the name of the region as well as the name of the tribe? That's a great question. Osmat is a, a I should say, Southern uh, Osmat territory. So mm-hmm. Got it. Osmat, uh, ethnic group that is in what would now be modern Indonesia, modern day Indonesia, South Papua. It's on like, if you look at the island, it's on the the southwestern coast and it's bordering a place called the Arafura Sea, which is also important because it's, you know, it's one of those places where you can think you're on a river and if you don't know what you're doing, you can find yourself in a uh, around and find out situation. And that's how they would have been traveling, right? Like by, by sea. By way of that. Yeah, by sea. And this place is so 
unknown to the West that Rockefeller and actually the entirety of the Dutch colonial government, they know one white guy who is like aware, like cool, knows his way around the place, has earned the trust of the people who live there. His name, Cornelius Van Kessel. And so Rockefeller and his crew say, okay, we've reached out, we've made some contacts, we're going to meet up with Van Kessel when we get to this remote area, and he's going to help us uh, kind of, he's going to liaise, right? Uh, And he will help us learn more about this culture, learn more about their practices, and come away with stuff for my art show. (laughs) <laughs> and right around this time is when something goes horribly wrong. And we'll continue this story right after a word from our sponsor. And we've returned. Okay, so we're we're on our second leg of the journey here with our protagonist, Michael, with Renee Wassing, who is, by the way, from the Dutch New Guinea Department of Native Affairs. Doesn't that just sound lovely coming off the tongue, he said sarcastically. Uh, But that's what it was called. And they're also with their two guides, their two younger guides, and they are traveling by boat, headed back out. So let's get back to them in the boat. Oh, yeah. This is where we go to Carl Hoffman. Uh, We're pulling directly from some of his writing. He says, as they began to cross the mouth of the Betz River, conflicting tides and winds whipped up waves and cross currents. Water that had been gentle one minute was heaving the next. A wave drowned their outboard and the catamaran began to drift. Then the waves capsized it. Uh, We should also mention this is a homemade catamaran. It is. This is not like really fancy. This is just a boat that floats. Yes. And the, like jerry cans. Mm-hmm. It looks like it's from Far Cry. It's that kind of thing. <laughs> Far Cry nice. 2? Uh, no, maybe. I don't know, it would probably be all of them. But, Any of them, really. <laughs> but uh, the outboard is the motor. That's what they're talking mm-hmm. about. And, yeah. of course, capsize just means it flipped over. Mm-hmm. And so these guides... Teenage, I mean, they're kids. They're familiar with the area. They know things are going wrong. They're like, we're going to go get help. They jump in the river. It's a big river. Sometimes if you haven't grown up around big rivers, you might think, well, how hard could it be to swim across a river? It's very difficult because this is, again, right on the coast of a sea. So they successfully make it to shore. But the shore is so far away that, uh, that Wasing and Rockefeller don't know they made it Mm -hmm. Uh, and these kids heroically trudge through miles and miles of very not cool terrain they make it back to the home base where they left and it's the evening it's late in the evening and they say we need to send help those other two dudes are still on the river somewhere and again would this happen for every person who went missing Probably not, but the Dutch colonial power structure there knows what a Rockefeller is, so they they send ships, they send helicopters, they send planes for this search. The entire time this search is happening, those two guys are clinging to the the remnants of their of their boat, and they realize they're getting closer and closer and closer to the open ocean, which is exactly what you don't want to happen. And it's my understanding that 24 hours passed, like from the capsizing to what the thing we're about to talk to next. At the very least, it was a long night. Uh, they were not, it, it's arduous, right? Clinging on a, on clinging to flotsam in water might sound easy. You know, uh, whomever that lady was in the Titanic, might have made it look easy to lay on a door, but it's exhausting. <laughs> did you see that uh, James Cameron recently did. did a experiment that proved that there was room for Jack on that door? <laughs> yes. He acknowledged it. I, am, I guess kudos to him for that. A jerry can, by the way, that's like a gas can, like a large gas can. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, you could kind of, yes. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and so he, they're, they're floating. They're exhausted. And they've got to do something because it's just going to get worse if they get out to the ocean because the ocean will eat things. 
Oh, yeah. Uh, so uh, Michael, being a, a man of action, decided to do something about it. He he stripped down to his underoos uh, and he attached two of the empty gas can, jerry can things to his belt to it like as a personal like improvised flotation device um and he tried desperately to get to the shore which would have been around between somewhere between 3 and up to 10 miles away uh presumably there's current so he's you know and he's weighed down by these cans so that's a lot that's an arduous swim right there yeah, and you know, according to the stories, uh, Renee told him not to do it. Like, don't do this, man. You don't have it in you. But Michael appeared to be determined uh, to to just go and try. Yeah, and he said, "Look, from my estimation, the shore has to be somewhere between three to ten miles away. You're right. It's a heck of a swim, but I've got these flotation devices." Right. So I won't have to be working the entirety of the time. And it's not like there we are alligators know. or snakes or sharks. <laughs> yeah. We, we don't know whether he was correct and we probably never will. And the reason we don't know this is because this man was never seen again. Still hasn't been seen by anybody. It still hasn't been officially confirmed. Right. The Rockefeller family has stayed mum on this. Uh, we will see some speculation, but right now, no, uh, no physical evidence nor physical remains of Michael Rockefeller have been found. Uh, the teenage guides were okay. Uh, they made it. And I believe Renee Wassing was all right as well. Yeah. The, the big search and rescue mission was successful and they did locate the remains of that boat and they found Renee Wassing on there and alive. Yep. And the only reason we know these details about what Michael did right before he disappeared is because Renee was able to recount that stuff. It sounds like Michael should have taken Renee's advice and stuck with him while clinging to that debris. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if you're lost, the best thing to do is stay where you are unless you have to go. And Michael felt like he had to go. And Renee felt like he, you know, also, as every enthusiast of Dungeons and Dragons knows, you don't split up the party. <laughs> Things go wrong. Uh, so this this triggers this huge Search, a, a cavalcade of searches, really, throughout decades. And in the aftermath of his di- disappearance, no physical evidence has been found. No living Michael Rockefeller has been found. Uh, no glasses, because he was wearing spectacles, have been found. No, uh, no confirmation of bones or remains. And that's why so many people have continued attempting to solve this mystery And we welcome you to this. If you have the answer, please write to us and help us with this question. What happened to Michael Rockefeller? And with that, we'll take a break, hear a word from our sponsors, and return. Here's where it gets crazy. Uh, Some people might know. If one of the theories is true, some people might know. But right now... No one knows for certain, right? Outside of a very remote part of modern day Indonesia, no one knows. And that those people would only know if part of these theories are true. If there is someone in that area who knows what happened, they're not, they're not going to say much about it. Well, yeah, because we talked about the resources that the Rockefellers have, right? Imagine you are a parent doesn't matter what kind of wealth you have. Just imagine you're a parent and imagine your child goes on a trip and that child goes missing while on that trip. I'm assuming you would use every resource you have to try and locate your child. Uh, In this case, the Rockefellers have all the resources. So when they start a full scale search, not like the, you know, the Dutch search that end up finding Renee, but this, this is like, just imagine on a, a whole other scale of searching for their son. And man, they, they throw everything they've got at it. 
It's weird though because they you know they charter a Boeing seven oh seven and they you know fill it with reporters and they you know um, in, end up around one hundred and fifty miles southeast of the Osmot region. Um, but they did did they not send some kind of serious search party like into the region where he disappeared? I'm I'm, I'm confused about that with those resources that we're talking about. You'd think they'd find some kind of crazy wilderness fixer type person to take a crew out there and not just have these like kind of sad newsless press conferences. Well, it was it. There were, there were teams out there searching. Okay. I mean, that's, that's what was going on. The problem was uh, having enough people who could, who could actually like translate. Right. And, Mm -hmm. and have discussions about, okay, well, did you see anything? What did, you know, what did you see and all of that? There weren't enough people to actually do that. Right. And aerial coverage is helpful, but it only does so much Mm -hmm. when you have when you have a dense forest area. Uh, Yeah, there were a lot of problems. And on November 24th, the Dutch minister of the interior is speaking to The New York Times and says, quote, there is no longer any hope of finding Michael Rockefeller alive. And that's only five (sighs) days after he goes missing. Yeah, yeah. And there, you know, again, this is also a a pretty tense period geopolitically for these folks. This is also not their first rodeo losing someone. I couldn't imagine that the Rockefeller family would have been okay with a statement like that. Well, uh, they're a little bit of a black box about some of this. And, you know, it's again to the point about being a concerned parent, you sometimes want the privacy. Right. So we don't we don't know how they may have personally felt about several of the turns in the investigation. But we do know nine days after we can confirm Michael Rockefeller swam away attempting to reach the shore, his father and his sister, his twin sister, flew home. They flew back to New York. And then if you fast forward two more weeks, the Dutch government calls off the search And eventually, Michael Rockefeller is declared legally dead, which we'll get to. Uh, But other searches follow, like we're saying. Uh, Right now, the official conclusion is Rockefeller either drowned, attempting to reach the shore, or he was attacked by a predator. We weren't just doing a bit there. That's hungry water at this time and in that part of the world. A shark could have. Shark attacks are very rare honestly, um, but it could have happened. A saltwater crocodile, could, he could have run into that. Uh, and that, that kind of attack is, that's a higher likelihood, honestly. Sure. Yeah. And the swim was more like somewhere between 12 to 14 miles. Jeez. So, we, yeah. yeah. I mean, that'll just wear you out unless that's your thing. You're like some sort of Olympic level endurance swimmer. I mean, that's that's more than half the length of the English Channel at the narrowest point at the Straits of Dover. Yeah, and again, theoretically, he had those flotation devices in the oil cans, right, or the gas cans. Maybe he could have taken breaks in between. You know, a lot of exertion. But again, just holding on to those is exertion. But if there's a, a current and you took a break and weren't actively paddling, wouldn't you kind of lose ga- ground? Head on know? back, yeah. Exposure, exhaustion. Oh, yeah. I mean, my goodness. Uh, we should note that there is footage you can see of uh, Michael's father, Nelson, being brought oil cans or uh, petroleum cans that are thought to be the ones, at least one I've seen, um, mm-hmm. that was thought to be one that Michael was carrying. Right, but again, these are generic jerry cans. Yeah. You know, they're not bespoke or monogrammed or anything like that, <laughs> which would be weird. That'd be a weird flex in anyway. a way. But, uh, but so, yeah, you can also see footage of people retracing the passage of this catamaran and going to these waters themselves. Carl Hoffman does this and describes it, again, beautifully in his work. So some Dutch officials at the time are being optimistic. Again, as we say, it's not their first rodeo. They have lost people. They know the waters well, too. And at least one guy says, you know, if Michael Rockefeller did reach the shore, he would probably be safe because here we consider the native populations pretty friendly. But how much of that is him just trying to reassure someone, trying to not be a jerk 
to someone who's lost a loved one uh, and how much of it is speaking from fact. I don't know. Well, and there's some timing stuff there that Carl Hoffman points out that we're going to get into later, just mm-hmm. about why a public statement from a Dutch official would probably be uh, positive, like overall on purpose when speaking about, you know, the tribes in New, New Guinea. Yeah. And then also speaking of timing, we have to remember there's a social lens in which this occurs. Some groups in the area were still practicing headhunting. We're still practicing cannibalism, simply the reality. And the colonial government there, and I mean the West in general, still had these crazy offensive ideas about people they consider primitive or savage. Quote, I mean, honestly, less than is what they were thinking. They have very condescending attitudes. And it's no surprise that the public sphere began to ignore well-established facts about how people can drown or die of exhaustion on the water. And instead, they started to glom onto these stories that Rockefeller had been killed or had been eaten or gone full heart of darkness. I mean, there's some pretty offensive Looney Tunes cartoons that depict that kind of stuff. You know, the idea of like, savages you know i mean it really was in the zeitgeist in such a way that it was in part popular culture you know and a complicating factor about this is that yes these practices are real but are how how sensationalized are they mm. right to to pull headlines how and also you know this is a very diverse part of the world so how broad of a brush are these right would that be the question like i i i you know what i'll do it uh this is a a problematic and dumb comparison but if you ever go to different countries and you're from the united states you will meet people who are surprised that you don't fit certain stereotypes Mm -hmm. that's just like a a human thing right you know they say oh you how many guns do you own (laughs) yeah and i mean even to today there are countries that like eat things that we consider taboo, you know, over over here in the U.S. So I mean, these kinds of cultural differences, while maybe not as extreme as cannibalism, um, they certainly still exist. Yeah. I, and, you know, I'm just pointing out some of the stuff that Leonard Nimoy already pointed out in In Search Of uh, when, when we had that episode, that some of the rituals that Michael was so interested in, right, the, the mangrove tree carving, the whole ritual of that, like as the tree is making its way to uh, the village center, at the rituals that take place after that all have to do with basically preparing for a battle, an attack uh, to to I think what they call it, make re- to revenge an, another tribe in which they're having war. So like. It's a it's based on violence. The the thing that Michael was so interested in that the tribes created. And that's just it's what a it veneration was. of ancestors too. It's it's all right? it's all of that. It's everything. It's all of that. It's like revenge for the ancestors or past injustices. There's not there there aren't really accidents in this belief system is the issue. Yes. Like if a disease occurs, that disease is an attack of some sort or retribution for something that you or your community did incorrectly. Yes, so it becomes very complicated. To so the generalization just is is uh, so problematic here. But it is real violent uh, stuff, or potentially violent stuff that you're dealing with. Whoop. Okay, hang on. We we did it. This doesn't always happen on this show, but we've we've gone deeper than we thought into the rabbit hole. Uh, there's still so much to explore. Uh, gentlemen, I think we're looking at a two-parter here. This is real. We definitely didn't record this later. Um, no, it's true. We did come to a place where we realized that there was a lot to cover uh, on this topic. And I think y'all will agree on conspiracy realism land. Oh, yes. Make sure you stick around for episode two because we're going to dive deep deep into the conspiracy. Sorry, I was doing my, my mama told me thing. Uh, but we're gonna, into the heart of darkness. <laughs> mm-hmm. there, there's just mm-hmm. so much to explore here, and we really do break apart a lot of this stuff in great detail. So stick around for episode two. Don't go away. Uh, and we'll be back in just a few days. Mm-hmm. In the meantime, you can reach out to us on social media, where we are Conspiracy Stuff on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. Conspiracy Stuff Show on Instagram and TikTok. And if you don't want to do any of that, why not just give us a phone call? You know what the number is. You already know, but we're going to tell you anyway. It's one eight three three S T D W Y T K. 
And if that doesn't quite bag your badgers, feel free to send us a good old-fashioned email where we are. Conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.